Hi boys and girls, I'm back again with you to do some more by the great horn spoon. And we know that Jack has the nickname of Jamoka Jack now for drinking all that coffee from Pitch Pine Billy. And we have Bullwhip, um, Praiseworthy is now called Bullwhip because of that strong punch that sent that outlaw flying when the stagecoach got robbed. So let's see how their adventures continue in Hangtown. Chapter 13 is titled A Bushel of Neckties. Now, neckties, those would be, you know, the ties that men wear around their necks when they're trying to dress up, right? Well, do the Goldfields sound like a place where you'd be dressing up? Not so much, right? And a bushel means you've got a large group of them, okay? So it's a whole bunch of neckties. I wonder what this has to do with our characters. Let's find out. Thirteen, a bushel of neckties. Sometime during the night, Cut Eye Higgins left Hangtown for parts unknown. In the days that followed, Praiseworthy's name and reputation spread through the diggings. He was pointed out to new immigrants as someone of consequence, and Jack basked in reflected glory. The truth of the matter was that Praiseworthy himself began to enjoy his notoriety. And like chameleons, the two partners changed their colors to those of the Sierra Nevadas. They wore red miners' shirts and jack boots and wide-brimmed hats against the summer sun. After a week in the diggings, there was little of the butler left to be seen in Praiseworthy, unless it was the straightness of his back and the quiet reserve of his glance. And then, as if to live up to his reputation, he stopped shaving. Within a few days, within a few days, within a few days, few days, he began to look decidedly fierce. Jack collected four tin cans against the day when they would stake their claim. They bought a dust-stained canvas tent at the Cheap John auction and pitched it beside Pitch Pine Billy's tent. All they lacked to go prospecting was a burrow and a grub stake of beans, bacon, flour, and coffee. They shoveled dirt and panned mud from morning till night. Pitch Pine Billy taught them every trick he knew, including the setting of flea traps. After dark, they filled their gold pans with soapy water and placed them beside a lighted candle stuck in the dirt floor of the tent. The candle gets the vomits to jumping, Pitch Pine Billy exclaimed. About the only thing a flea ain't learned to do is take a bath. They hop in that soap water and drown. But candles were a dollar each and some of the miners preferred the fleas. There were days when a man was lucky to wash out enough spangles to pay for his grub, while an ounce of gold brought $16 far away in San Francisco. It was worth a mere $4 at the diggings, and it didn't buy much. Onions were a dollar fifty cents a pound. Supplies had to be freighted in, and prices were high. Salt pork sold for 50 cents an ounce. Gold dust seemed more plentiful than flour. Hay was weighed out at 8 cents a pound. Oh, I seen some mighty fancy prices, laughed Pitch Pine Billy, frying up a loaf of bread in his gold pan. There was a fella come to the diggings with a jar of raisins. The boys ain't seen a raisin since they left home, and their mouths began to slabber. You'd think it was caviar in that jar. Them raisins fetch their weight in gold old dust come to four thousand dollars slowly day by day praiseworthy and jack added to their grub stake they had blankets a dozen candles and a coffee pot one noon jack pulled up a tuft of grass and a glint of light from the roots made him gasp a nugget and then his yell carried from one end of the ravine to the other Praiseworthy dropped his gold pan, and Pitch Pine Billy squinted. Jimmy from town, who wore a mustache twisted into sharp points, came running over, and Buffalo John awoke from a sound sleep. Sound sleep. Soon a dozen miners had left their claims to stand around and admire Jack's catch. The lump of gold was the size of an acorn. It was trapped in the fine grass roots like a fly in a spider's web. 
maybe it'll buy us a burrow. Well, I don't know, smiled Pitch Pine Billy. The tail of a jackass, anyway. Buffalo John pulled the bandana off his head and polished the nugget. The miners passed it around, holding it up to the sun to watch it shine. And from that moment on, it became known as Jamoka Jack's Nugget. That night, Praiseworthy and Jack and Pitch Pine Billy went to town for supper. There was a letter waiting at the hotel from Dr. Buckby. It was written in a shaky hand. My dear friends, your letter finds me weakened by the yellow fever from Panama, and I can barely hold this pen steady. Curse that Higgins fellow and the gang of highwaymen you write of. Since I cannot leave my bed, please act as my agents in the matter. If you are able to recover my map, I will make you partners in the mine. Fifty-fifty. Act quickly, I beg of you, before all is lost. Praiseworthy finished reading the letter and folded it thoughtfully. A generous enough offer, he said to Jack. Half interest in a gold mine. Jack's yellow eyebrows lifted. All they had to do was get on the trail of those road agents. We'll need guns, he said quickly. A four-shooter would fit fine in his belt, alongside his horn spoon and buckskin pouch. Maybe he could trade his nugget for a pistol. Praiseworthy scratched through the stubble growing out on his face. What we need is a burrow. A burrow to chase outlaws? Praiseworthy put the letter in his shirt pocket. He shook his head. We've no time for such speculations. First, those vultures no doubt ripped open Cut Eye Higgins' coat and discovered the map. Second, they may already have located the mine by now. Maps? Pitch Pine Billy laughed. Why, there are so many maps floating around the diggings you could paper a room with them. Boys, let's eat. They ordered hangtown fries, platters of bacon, canned oysters, and eggs. Praiseworthy turned to Jack. What do you want to drink? Jack glanced up at the waiter. Coffee. Coffee, sir. With a few acorns ground up. <laughs> After dinner, Praiseworthy stayed behind in the hotel lobby to reply to Dr. Buckby's letter. Jack and Pitch Pine Billy went wandering along the street to see the sights. The auction bell began to clang. Maybe Chief John would have pistols to sell, Jack thought. Let's go, he said. No mind, said Pitch Pine Billy. The auctioneer placed a keg of salt butter outside the brightly lit tent and the miners gathered around this delicacy like flies. They unclasped their jackknives and carved off butter shavings and ate them off their blades. Between the ringing of the bell and the free butter, a crowd had formed and the sale began. Frenchmen rubbed shoulders with Sonorians and Chileans with Germans and Missourians with Yankees and Englishmen with Kanakas from the Sandwich Islands. There were sailors who had deserted their ships to run off to the mines, and soldiers who had left their garrisons at Monterey and San Francisco. The auctioneer mounted a barrel at the rear of the tent. He was a paunchy man in an open vest and a plug hat. What do you take for the hat, Chief John? Someone yelled. Ain't for sale. But I got ten pounds of Chinese sugar that is. Where do I bid, gents? Who give me a dollar a pound? Dollar, 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 dollar. I got a dollar. Who give me a dollar and a half? Half, half, half. Two dollars. Am I bid two dollars, boys? Two, two. Dos pesos, said a Spaniard with silver buttons down his trouser legs. Jack waded through the sale of sugar, a wheelbarrow, tin pans, butcher knives, and a sack of dried apples. The auctioneer seemed to have no guns. The miners stood around, whittling and enjoying themselves. I got a bushel of necktie set here by mistake, boys, said the Chief John. They'd fetch a dollar apiece back in the States. What do you give me for the lot? Am I bid ten dollars? Am I bid nine dollars? Nine? Nine? The miners stood grinning and whittling and silent. At that moment, Jimmy from town spied Jack and Pitch Pine Billy. Let's go get something to eat, he said. 
My stomach feels like a cat in Hades without claws. Nine, 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 called the auctioneer. We've done, said Pitchpine Billy. Done what? asked Jimmy from town, twisting the ends of his mustache hungrily. Eight, said Jack. Eight, eight, eight. I'm bid eight dollars by the young fellow with the yellow eyebrows. Sold for eight dollars. Jack stood as if struck by lightning. The miners began to chuckle. <laughs> Looks like you bought yourself a bushel of neckties, Jamoka Jack. But I said eight, not eight. That's what I heard you say. Eight, answered the Chief John, pushing the plug hat to the back of his head. A-T-E. We ain't much on spelling around here. It was clear to everyone that the auctioneer hadn't expected to be able to sell the ties at all. You ain't going back on your word, are you? Can't do that. I'd rather see you break your leg than you would, boy. Hey, up. The auctioneer was grinning. Why, you got them ties dirt cheap. Of course, we ain't much on tie wearing here at the diggings. Except to be buried in. And he burst out laughing. The miners looked upon the affair as harmless fun. Might be able to stuff a pillow with them. Someone called out. Now them together and lasso chickens. Jack stepped up to the gold scale and pulled the buckskin pouch from his belt. The nugget tumbled out. He borrowed a knife and carved half of it away. Bit by bit, it hurt. He clamped his jaws with anger. Then he picked up the bushel of neckties and worked his way through the crowd to the street. Ain't so sure I'd even want to be buried in one of them things. A miner laughed. Praiseworthy was coming along the street from the hotel, and Jack could barely face him. He had cut two ounces off his nugget that might have gone toward their grub stake or a gun. But even Pitch Pine Billy and Jimmy from town were chuckling. What have you got there? Praise where they asked, raising one eyebrow. Neckties, a whole bushel of them. Praise where they raised the other eyebrow. Neckties? Yes, sir. Jimmy from town loosened his gold pouch. I guess it was my fault. He smiled. I'll pay for them ties to Mocha Jack as long as you don't make me wear one. Me either, grinned Pitch Pine Billy. Praise where they held up his hand. Put away your dust. He looked at Jack. That was a fine purchase. A brilliant purchase. Jack gazed up at Praiseworthy. What? We'll buy our mountain canary with neckties. Pitch Pine Billy crimped an eye. You going out of your head, Bullwhip? Why, you couldn't give them things away in Hangtown. The only necktie you can get on a man is made out of rope. Praiseworthy scratched his short whiskers. They were at an itchy stage. He smiled, half shutting one eye. Unless I miss my guess, every man in the diggings will come begging for a necktie in a day or two. They'll fight to get one. He picked up the bushel basket and swung it to his shoulder. Come along, partner. Hmm. So, do we all understand how Jack accidentally bought these neckties? He's at an auction, right? And you yell out the prices. And he said eight, but he meant he'd already eaten the ATE eight. And the auctioneer heard eight, thinking the E-I-G-H-T. These words are homophones. They're two words that sound the same, but they're spelled differently. Very different meanings. But in, you know, Gold Rush, you can't go back on your word. If you say something, you've got to stick by it. Otherwise, things don't turn out very pretty for you. Does praiseworthy seem bothered? They've got a bunch of ties in a place where men are rough and rugged. But yet... He's saying that in a couple of days, everyone's going to want one. What would make men want to dress up and look nice? Hmm. Let's keep reading. The next morning, Praiseworthy and Jack helped Pitch Pine Billy dig a coyote hole. Once we hit bedrock, there's no telling the riches down there, the miner declared. The spangles keep working and sifting through the ground. Earthquakes and all. It may take them 10,001 years to reach bedrock, but that stops them. By late afternoon, the big hole was deeper than Praiseworthy's head. They rigged up a rope and lifted out dirt by the buckets full. There were men all along the diggings coyoteing for gold, and some of the shafts were as deep as wells. 
Jack took his turns at the bottom of the hole, filling buckets that were emptied into the long tom. The long tom was a wooden sluice box set in the stream. Rushing water washed the dirt along a trough, and the bits of gold were trapped in iron riffles along the bottom. Praiseworthy kept silent about the neckties. Even by the end of the next day, there was no rush to buy them as he had predicted. But he remained unconcerned. Jack wondered if Praiseworthy had merely been trying to spare his feelings after the ridiculous purchase he'd made. He was glad to forget it and said no more. The following morning, a delegation of three men appeared on Pitch Pine Billy's claim. Jack recognized Mr. Jonas T. Fletcher at once. The undertaker had brought two hangtown merchants with him. They came looking for Praiseworthy, who was at the bottom of the coyote hole. Jack and Pitch Pine Billy hauled him out on a rope, and Praiseworthy looked as if he had been dipped in dust. It clung to his eyelashes as he blinked. If bedrock's any deeper, he said to Pitch Pine Billy, we'll be digging for gold in China. Bullwhip, said the undertaker, you've got to uphold the fair name of Hangtown. What's that? We've just been delivered a challenge. Praiseworthy began beating the dirt out of his slouch hat. Is that so? Yep. A fellow over at Grizzly Flats has heard about you. He says he can whip you. Jack looked up. Praiseworthy hardly blinked an eye. He merely continued knocking the dust out of his hat. Is that so? Yep. Of course, he don't know B from a bull's foot to make a statement like that. He ain't exactly bright, although I understand he can write his own name if you give him time enough. But he is a regular big fella. The Mount Knox, they call him. Well, how about it? It doesn't sound like a fair match. The undertaker nodded. He does have you on height and weight and reach and general meanness, I suppose. That's not what I meant. It wouldn't be fair to him. The three gentlemen from Hangtown responded with a blank look. How's that? Even Jack was startled by Praiseworthy's declaration. The mountain ox sounded enormous. Praiseworthy wouldn't have a chance. Had he begun to believe his own reputation? From what you tell me, gentlemen, the man can barely read and write. He'll be at a decided disadvantage. Pitch Pine Billy pulled his hat down over his ears. Bull Whip, will you tell me what reading and writing has got to do with a bare knuckle fighting match? I suppose that remains to be seen. Then you'll fight him? The undertaker grinned. Not by choice, sir. But if the fair name of Hangtown is at stake, I suppose I must. The delegation smiled. How about next Tuesday? Impossible. By next Tuesday, we'll have our burrow and grub stake and be far away prospecting. My partner and I have a fortune to make, and time is running out. We'll be returning this way by the middle of August at the very latest. You can plan the match for the 15th, sir. The three gentlemen from Hangtown nodded and departed. Jack gazed at Praiseworthy as if a complete stranger had been hiding through the years under the elegant manners of a butler. He was enchanted. But Pitch Pine Billy whipped off his hat and jumped on it. Bull Whip, you've gone and lost your reason. Before the 15th day of next month shows up, you better make out your last will and testament. <laughs> So do you guys catch on to what Phraseworthy has just agreed to do? He just agreed to fight somebody named the Mountain Ox, a man who's known for how big and strong and mean he is. Phraseworthy's not a natural fighter, and he had gold in his gloves when fighting. It's a bare knuckle match, meaning no gloves. He's just fight for fighting, but he says he'll do it. How many of you think Phraseworthy can win this thing? And we're like, uh-oh, they better skip town. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Jack had just lowered himself into the coyote hole when a sudden excitement spread through the diggings, and he pulled himself out again. There was a shout of voices back and forth across the stream from claim to claim. Oh, Porch Jackson is back, and has brought his new missus with him. Men dropped their shovels and gold pans and abandoned their long toms. Miners crawled out of coyote holes. What's that? 
Him and the lady is putting up at the hotel. The excitement even touched Pitch Pine Billy. Boys, he said to Praiseworthy and Jack. Hey, hey, Jack. Hey, hey, hey. I ain't seen a lady in so long, I near forgot what they look like. Praiseworthy rested his arms on the handle of his shovel and grinned. He gave Jack a nod. This is the day we've been waiting for, partner. Watch and see. Pitchpine Billy scowled. Well, don't just stand there. Look at you both. Dirt sticking out on you like you ain't had a bath all year. Why, it's a disgrace. I'm ashamed of you. You heard what they said. There's a lady in town. Within five minutes, miners were everywhere along the stream, scrubbing and shouting and planning to go to town. Pitchpine Billy waded in with his clothes on and kept dumping hatloads of water over his head. Later, shirts and trousers could be seen on every bush, drying out in the mountain heat. Men stood at mirrors tacked to trees and got out their straight razors. Half a dozen familiar beards disappeared. Others were trimmed and shortened. Praiseworthy took his time. When he and Jack emerged from their canvas tent, they were wearing bright green neckties. Pitch by Billy stood fluffing out his beard. He stopped and he stared. Help yourself, said Praiseworthy. That is, if it's all right with my partner. It's fine with me. Pitch by Billy grinned. Don't mind if I do. The neckties were so bright they could be seen across the river. Soon the miners who had laughed at Jack the night of the auction were swarming about the bushel basket. I'll give you a pinch of dust for one of them neckties, Jamoka Jack. I'll give you two pinches. Pitch Pine Billy was laughing. Don't fight, boys. Just get in line there. Looks like Jamoka Jack is caught in the necktie market. He caught you sleeping, didn't he? <laughs> Just hold your pouches open and I'll pinch out the gold, since I got the biggest thumbs in the diggings. Praiseworthy stood idly by, with his foot on a stump, and lit a long nine cigar. Within twenty minutes, the basket was empty. Every necktie was gone. Pitch Pine Billy pulled the strings on Jack's buckskin pouch and handed it over. It was heavy as a plummet. Jack waited in his hand and tossed the pouch to Praiseworthy. That ought to get us a burrow. And maybe a gun, Praiseworthy said, taking the heft of it. He tossed the pouch back. Yes, sir, that cheap John had better learn B from a bull's foot to get the better of Jamoka Jack. Gents, let's go to town. The miners had formed a crowd outside the Empire Hotel, and when Quartz Jackson brought his lady out under the porch, the miners whipped off their hats as if it were the United States flag they were looking at. By the great horn spoon, Pitchpine Billy muttered in awe. A genuine woman. She had sparkling eyes and a smile for everyone. Quartz Jackson wore a vest with a watch chain across it and looked proud enough to burst. We freighted up some cut lumber, he said, the missus and me. We're going to build a cabin, and you boys are always welcome to drop in for tea. Ain't that right, Hannah? Hannah, Pitch Pine Billy murmured. Ain't that the prettiest name you ever heard? Quartz Jackson looked out over the crowd. He recognized Praiseworthy and Jack and gave them a nod. Step up, boys, and I'll introduce you. Make it fast before you strangle in their neckties. <laughs> Alrighty, so why? Why did buying these neckties turn out to be a great thing? Well, there's a lady in town. And from what we've been reading and what was the gold rush, you should know by now that having a lady in town was a rare thing. Women were considered extremely valuable. They could cook, they could do laundry, they could sew, they could do all kinds of amazing things that the men really missed from being back at home. And so the chance to see a lady, they wanted to impress her. They wanted to look good. They wanted to be on their best behavior in front of her. And Praiseworthy knew that it was about that time that uh, Quartz Jackson would be returning with his bride. So it turned out to be a smart move. They're ready to get their burrow. And well, in the next chapter, it is the prospectors, meaning they're going to be setting out on their way. But you'll have to wait for that. 
So let's talk about your assignment today. You have your chapter 13, Bushel of Neckties, summary to write. So think, overall, what was this chapter about? Yes, the ties are important. They're in the title and they're what gets them the money, right? They need the money in order to buy the burrow to then go out prospecting and they are running out of time. So I would expect to see some details in there about those neckties. There's a something else though that's kind of big that mattered in this chapter and it has to do with the 15th of August. So I'm giving you that little hint. Make sure you don't forget about that because after all, if a man makes a promise to do something or says he'll do something, he has to keep his words in the gold fields. All right, boys and girls, so you're going to type your summary, put in a picture. Can't wait to see what you do. Bye.